We are now recording. Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time on a beautiful summer afternoon here uh, in New Jersey to join us uh, for uh, the next of our installments of our professional development series, the New Jersey Distance Education Affinity Group, partnering with the New Jersey Center for Student Success and a, a very special partner with us today, some colleagues from Rowan University um, to talk about delivering high quality education during disruptive times. Next slide, please. There it is. Next slide, please. So hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who've not had the, I've not had the chance to meet in person, I'm Jake Farbman. I'm the executive director of your statewide Center for Student Success. We are one of 16 states that have such a statewide student success center. Uh, our success center was uh, founded in 2011. Uh, we're one of the founding states in this network uh, to help advance student success and improve student completion. Um, throughout the country at our country's community colleges. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, you'll hear from me very briefly and, I, and my job is to just be the, uh, the provide the housekeeping uh, rules, so to speak. So um, we're very grateful to President Monroe of Estes County College and Dr. Bella DeCastro of Estes County College for providing Estes County College's Zoom platform for us to use for these webinars. Um, as such, uh, even in the summer, these uh, technologies are taxed. So we have a few things we're going to ask of all of you. Uh, one, uh, if you are not one of our presenters, uh, please turn your audio off. Mute your um, uh, microphones. That would be great. Uh, and, and two, if you're not one of our presenters, if you could turn your camera off. It's not that we don't want to talk with you. It's not that we don't want to see you. I, I would love to see everybody's smiling faces and have wonderful vert Avert conversations with all of you. We just don't want to tax the system and have it crash while we're recording this a very important webinar. Uh, so if you are, have the ability to turn your microphone off, turn your camera off, we would greatly appreciate it just so we don't tax the system and tax your bandwidth as well where you're logging in from remotely. As you're hearing our presenters, uh, please Type your questions in the chat area. You'll see as you move your mouse over your Zoom screen, you'll see a little chat box at the bottom. If your, if your um, uh, chat is not already appearing on your right-hand side, um, you'll be able to type your questions in the chat. And uh, th there are some of us on the line who are gonna be monitoring the chat, the chat during the conversation, and we will answer your questions at the end of the presentation, okay? Next slide, please. And just a shout out to our distance education affinity group officers. Uh, some of these names may be familiar to all of you if you're uh, logging in from these institutions. Uh, the president is Josh Pittington of Rowan College of South Jersey, the vice president on the line, our, our quarterback, uh, Dr. Lee Bella de Castro from Essex County College, and our secretary, Dr. Nora Kerr McCurry of Brookdale Community College have been uh, exceptional in helping to um, identify speakers, uh, topics, and deliver this um, very valuable professional development to our faculty and staff throughout the state. So just, just a thank you to the Distance Education Affinity Group. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bella DeCastro. Thank you all for being with us. Hi everyone, thank you again. And uh, thank you, Jake. <clears throat> so we wanted to uh, thank everybody here on the line. Right now we have about 75, or, and I think we're expecting about 200 plus people here today. So we appreciate you taking uh, some time during uh, the summer break. But I wanted to go over today's agenda with you. So we do have two fantastic presenters um, today. And as some of you, I, I noticed some of the names on here um, we're, we've moved into the four-year arena, so we wanted to thank our partners and thank you so much. So on our agenda today is the context, um, and that's, once again, it's all over the disruptiveness of everything that's going on. Uh, it's, we are going to discuss education and emergency standards, research informed strategies to deal with these disruptions, practical ideas, and then, as Jake indicated, we're going to get into um, some discussion and questions. So myself and Jake and a couple others are going to be monitoring the chat. 
Uh, so at this time, and, and we are recording, uh, and then we'll go over later on, Jake, right, where everything can be found later on. So once again, thank you all for being here. And I'd love and I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Monica Reed Kerrigan and Dr. Ann Turner Johnson for our presentation today. And thank you both. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we're really excited to be here with you. Uh, my name is Monica Reed Kerrigan. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Educational Services and Leadership Department at Rowan University. I teach in the Educational Leadership Doctoral Program and coordinate the Community College Leadership Track of that program. Um, that goes a long way to uh, supporting the partnership that we have with um, all of the community colleges in the state and the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. Uh, my research focuses on the institutional structures and public policies that influence the transition of marginalized students into and through higher education, but particularly community colleges. My commitment to support community college students and staff, as well as my 10 years of experience in teaching hybrid and online formats, uh, inform our presentation today. Hello all, my name is Dr. Ann Turner Johnson. Um, I am also an associate professor in the Educational Leadership Doctoral Program at Rowan University. Uh, Monica and I are colleagues, uh, very good colleagues and friends. Um, and we're thrilled to be presenting uh, this topic to you today. Um, I've been teaching online in the doctoral program since 2011. I also teach using uh, not just uh, fully based uh, um, online, but also hybrid uh, modalities, which are 60% online and 40% face-to-face at Roman. Um, I uh, do research on something a little different. Um, I actually conduct research on higher education in Africa, specifically a focus on how universities recover from war and the process of rebuilding and peace building. Uh, so a lot of today's presentation will also be inspired by some of those research experiences I have and my expertise in education and emergencies. Next slide, please. So um, a little bit about the program that uh, Dr. Johnson and I both teach in. Um, our educational leadership EDD began over 20 years ago and the community college track, otherwise known as CCLI, was established 13 years ago in collaboration with the New Jersey Council of County Colleges and New Jersey College uh, Community College Presidents. Our program is offered in multiple modalities, which gives us the opportunity to come to you today with experience teaching fully online in a hybrid format and face-to-face. -face. Uh, we offer multiple tracks, including P12, higher education, nurse educator, in addition to our CCLI track. It's also an accelerated program that enables working professionals to pursue their doctorate part-time. Um, although they are at a different point professionally, like your students, our students balance personal and professional commitments to pursue their educational goals. Our experiences with them, and in some cases, their actual words and advice are threaded throughout this presentation. Next slide, please. So we won't uh, belabor the context of um, what I think we're all experiencing right now, uh, pan the, uh, specifically the pandemic. But we, we do see that the, the content of this presentation can transcend our current context to take into consider um, other sort of disruptive uh, experiences that we have in education and, um, and how um, there are certain ways that we can engage in our practice to alleviate uh, the disruptive, uh, disruptions and to support student success. So our presentation today will be based somewhat on the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, which is a global network of representatives from NGOs, UN agencies, donor agencies, governments, academic institutions, and schools and other affected populations working together to ensure all persons the right to quality of safe education um, in emergencies and as well as in post-crisis recovery. Uh, so this network has put together a compendium of minimum standards uh, that are critical to effective educational response to crisis. Um, I'm a member of this network and have contributed to their work on higher education and crisis. 
uh, INEE standards and accompanying technical guidance notes in addition to our experiences as online instructor, instructors were combined to create the figure you see to the right um, of the screen. These concepts and accompanying strategies will provide the framework for our presentation today. Next slide, please. So first we wanna start talking about the necessity of care and supporting well-being during times of crisis. Everyone experiences crisis differently. Crises have dimensions that may disproportionately impact one group or another. So for example, women are often the first to be laid off. Uh, so the effects of the pandemic may be particularly acute for them. The classroom can provide some psychological safety for both instructors and students as education develops the skills and relational supports essentials for, essential for a healthy social ecology, psychosocial well-being, and long-term resilience. Furthermore, the routine of the classroom can provide stability during disruption. The structure, schedule, and, expe um, and expectations can seem familiar when little else does. These can be used to support well-being during disruption. Next slide. So the first step in demonstrating care is to acknowledge the existence of the crisis and its impact on yourself as instructors and on your students. It's important to note that this is not business as usual and plans, expectations, and commitments may change. Although we all endeavor to be there for our students, your own well-being is paramount. Practicing self-care in whatever form that takes for you is key at a time as is reflecting and uh, sharing your own experiences. As one of our students said, um, set up a schedule, get up every day, get dressed, eat, our focus is also on supporting student well-being. So acknowledge the increased cognitive load on students as they wrestle not only with conventional academic difficulties, but also with the challenges of the pandemic in this case. Next slide, please. So as you consider ways to reduce stress and provide stability for students, we encourage you to set expectations early. At the outset of the fall semester, uh, let students know what your expectations are and how you plan to conduct class if there are any disruptions. Uh, use the summer to consider how you will teach um, so that you're prepared on that first day, regardless of the modality you end up teaching in during the fall. And share that with your students. Uh, one of our students advised, be specific and state how you will communicate. Every professor is different. This is actually a really useful reminder. While you may approach your classes all the same way, your students are in multiple classes with different faculty who have different approaches and different expectations. Next slide. Coordination during crisis necessitates a systems approach to planning. Uh, this means taking into consideration as much as you possibly can the internal and external factors that will impact student success. Uh, to maintain student persistence and their engagement with their education and the educational organization, your institution, you need to organize your instruction and your instructional activities. Um, of course you do, right? <laughs> uh, so for example, research shows that at, when um, education is provided in emergencies, uh, collaborative instructor guided learning is the most effective approach to pedagogy. Um, in addition, you'll need to collaborate across courses and with your colleagues to leverage existing resources. Um, and you may need to connect with other campus, uh, offices on campus, like advising or the wellness center, even the food pantry. Um, an important caveat, which I'm sure you've all experienced, is that these social distancing and physical distancing guidelines that we are, um, are working under means that coordination now, right, looks a lot different than it used to in the past. So a lot of this has to be done, of course, remotely. Next slide, please. Coordinating strategies should address students and colleagues alike. For your students, help them, help them set personal goals that may help them remain focused and committed even during difficulties. Establishing a clear connection between their goals and their learning supports this. Then remember your colleagues 
indeed, this distance education advisory uh, group uh, uh, network is a resource for you, right? So you're already all on this group. Um, identify few colleagues with whom you can share materials, scaffold work across courses, and leverage the existing resources that are already out there. There's no need to invent everything from scratch on your own. Finally, sometimes we forget that students can also tell us what would be most helpful. So don't be afraid to ask, and that indeed ask throughout the semester. Next slide, please. So I think this is one of my favorite um, pieces of advice and some of the strategies that we're gonna provide you is um, this notion of affirming um, students and affirming our practice as professionals, uh, specifically the notion of do no harm. So based in the Hippocratic Oath, the adage do no harm is an essential basis of the work of organizationals and professionals who work in crisis context and definitely is applicable to our work to ensure that the activities we engage in don't worsen the crisis, but rather contribute to improving it. With this in mind, we can seek to identify those actions, activities, or resources in our courses that support or challenge student persistence. Resources in particular equate to power in times of crisis. So it's particularly important that we evaluate our positions, the dynamics that we create in our classrooms, and the needs students have to be successful and affirm that we first must do no harm. Next slide. The idea of doing no harm can be challenging because it forces us to re-examine what we take for granted. For example, consider what resources are really needed for your course and how to minimize the differential impact on students. Not everyone has access to the internet, a computer, and budgets may be tighter than usual. What OER and other materials are relevant and easily accessible? Something that does not cost money is building community Use your course or the program as a basis on which to highlight students' shared goals, rec recognize accomplishments, and reflect on the progress that has been made even under difficult circumstances. Next slide. So it's important um, as we engage in our practice uh, during these disruptive times to take into consideration that crisis has no definitive beginning or end point. In fact, it's a multifaceted event. So as a result, we should be constantly monitoring to understand the impact of our activities on students' experiences. Analysis can uncover barriers to access, the assets students have to succeed, and the continued relevance of our activities. The data we collect can help us to identify capacities, resources, vulnerabilities, gaps, and challenges to student success. This is more than a one-time activity. In my own work, I discovered that after the crisis, while students had returned to the classroom, the library was still not functional. Students were having to get together and sift through large piles of materials on the library form in order, uh, floor in order to find the things that they needed to be successful in their courses. And when I spoke to faculty, I found out that oftentimes a lot of them didn't know this. So it's really important that we're um, analyzing not just our classroom, but those facilities outside of our classroom and how they may be impacting student learning. Next slide, please. And quickly, this picture over here to the right is, in fact, that pile of materials that students were having to sift through in order to get the information they needed to, to do their coursework. So strategies to analyze your context do not have to be labor intensive. Um, on the first day of class, gather some baseline information about student circumstances. Most learning management systems or even Google Forms allow you to quickly poll your students about their access to the internet, whether they have their own computers or tablets, um, time and space to focus on coursework, and whether they've already experienced a disruption in their learning, such as an incomplete, that might affect their current class. Uh, also consider those institutional disruptions that Dr. Johnson just mentioned. Um, as, she, as she said, this picture depicts a library um, that was open, but clearly not usable as books stat in disorganized piles. So think of a corollary at your college. Um, for example, layoffs um, may affect a staff 
who were previously there to help students and may not be there at this time. So that might have affected students' ability to get the help and resources they need to be successful. Also, uh, just a reminder to not just check in at the start of term, um, but to check in periodically throughout the term because things change as we noticed this past spring. Next slide. So being flexible is an important skill during disruption. Uh, this adaptation means either resisting or changing in order to reach and maintain an acceptable level of functioning and structure. Uh, indeed, this type of uh, work that we do when we're adapting builds our capacity um, and that of our students in order to respond to future crisis. So consider what might need to change in order to support your vulnerable students. Uh, what interventions may be necessary um, and then how can we may adapt those interventions so that they're appropriate to our classes and our students needs. And um, how can we then experiment purposefully and carefully in order to ensure student success? Next slide, please. Adapting strategies should be informed by those data that we discussed earlier. Although you may be a professor who normally does not grant extensions or take excuses, uh, now is the time to consider extending or easing deadlines. Where possible, try to turn your own work back to students as soon as possible to tighten the connection between their learning on assignments and your input. Times of crises may require much more high touch strategies than are normal for you. Also consider reducing but not eliminating group work. Purposeful group work maintains connections, but excessive group work can do harm as students are trying to cope with new stresses in addition to their usual coursework. Next slide. So we also want to talk about um, some specific strategies to be prepared to move forward. Um, if you have to pivot quickly online this fall. Uh, so next slide, please. So clearly, since we're doing this webinar at the start of summer, the thought was that you could use summer to prepare for fall. Um, recognizing that uh, your course teaching, your loads may be in flux and you may not know for sure, but these are just some suggestions if you can plan. It will certainly make your semester um, easier if you can do some pre-planning in advance. Uh, if you're already teaching online, you know that online teaching requires greater preparation before you actually walk into the classroom or appear online. To that end, um, Start now by connecting with colleagues who teach the same or similar courses at your institution or other institutions. Take advantage of this network. Instruction, instructors on this network uh, have great resources that already exist so that, again, you don't have to create them yourself. Start an LMS shell now so that the basics are ready when you need them. This includes your syllabus, a folder for each week of the term with some resources, and a spreadsheet with the contact information for your students and yourself. When students don't see their classmates regularly in class, it becomes even more important that they have a way to connect with their peers and their instructor. Next slide, please. Familiarize yourself with the LMS that you're going to be using. Um, some of the resources include announcements, uh, announcement serves as a mechanism to ensure regular communication from you as the instructor. Screen sharing enables you to mark up examples, share presentations, and even provide limited technical support um, if necessary. The whiteboard is your online equivalent to the whiteboard in your classroom, and you can still have students break out into groups to discuss concepts or questions online before bringing that back as a large group. In addition, course analytics are a resource to help you keep track of students' engagement and can help you be proactive in reaching out to students whose activity has fallen off or who haven't logged on. 
I know Dr. Johnson makes uh, a lot of use of course analytics in her online courses. I do. Uh, they have been so helpful in helping me follow up with students who I can see um, what, what they're viewing, how often they're viewing uh, resources in the course, um, how often they're engaging with uh, each other and with course resources. So it's been a very useful tool to me, um, particularly this past spring when I was teaching and um, I was teaching research methods and no one, no one likes that class, unfortunately. <laughs> and so it was really critical to being able to follow up with students who, um, who, who may already not be as interested in the content um, and then we're also experiencing um, in their professional and personal lives uh, the impact of the crisis. Next slide, please. Communication is critical in online courses and even more important during emergencies. Consider using the summer to prepare a series of announcements that can be pre-scheduled um, that will then send automatically during the semester. This does not eliminate the ad hoc communication that you'll engage in during the semester, but it reduces the burden on you as the instructor when things are busiest. You can address a weekly overview, reminders, difficulties that you can anticipate students will have, and so on. In addition, the weekly overview uh, email announcement um, is one of the most useful tools for online learning. Uh, even though students have all of the information already available in their syllabus, they respond remarkably well to an email or an announcement that's sent at the start of each week that summarizes the readings that they'll have to do uh, the assignments they have, and any other pertinent information. It also helps promote regular communication from you and contributes to the presence that you maintain in the course, even if you're not meeting physically. Next slide. So back in March, when um, we were uh, not able to be on campus anymore. Uh, we, I, I reached out to our students um, as our college uh, and, my, and our colleagues were frantically trying to shift online um, from their face-to-face. -face. Now, of course, we've been teaching online for a long time now, and our students um, come into our program um, with the intention of learning entirely online. So we had a, a lot of experience, and we're all really accustomed to the rigors of online work. Uh, so in order to reach out um, to assist our colleagues with this transition process, um, myself and uh, my colleagues um, sent out a brief survey to our students um, asking for their advice. What advice would you give to a new um, uh, instructor, an instructor who was teaching online for the first time, and what advice would you give to a student who's now learning online for the first time? And we received a bevy of responses, um, both very practical and uh, responses really focused on well-being, um, which I thought was really interesting because there was a lot of feedback and advice on how to, um, how to remain resilient uh, during um, this disruptive time. So uh, Dr. Kerrigan, do you wanna get us started here? Sure. So um, the advice they had uh, for the instructors included, um, you know, it takes a while to feel comfortable online. Don't be hard on yourself. Um, we thought that was uh, really, um, encouraging from our students right for them to be telling us that as as faculty or telling other faculty that remembering that we are human too <laughs> exactly um encourage uh, sorry engage students through instructor presence the first two weeks are critical to set up the class mood uh creating a healthy social interaction balances the class and creates equal environment for open communication so they felt it was really important um, to set the tone at the start of class which is why uh, one of our earlier recommendations to you was to prepare um, and to, to, to tell students what they could anticipate if um, there was a disruption, how you've planned ahead. I would um, add to, um, if I may, uh, just that it also recognizes the dynamic that the instructor can create and um, develop in a course. Uh, so it's, I think, really important to keep in mind uh, our role in creating and building community in an online environment. Monica. 
Yeah, and then um, uh, another piece of advice was to make sure um, you're consistent with directions in all the places they might be. So for example, I mentioned earlier um, a, a weekly email or announcement. Um, that was not meant to create more work for you, but really uh, cut, copy and paste. Um, number one, that reduces right the, the work you have to do by copy and pasting, but it also ensures that directions are consistent uh, and you don't tell students to do one thing in one place and something else in another, which creates the confusion that can be problematic in a course. So some advice that you can also give to your students that our students offer it um, to take time to explore the LMS. Uh, it, there is no, um, there aren't, uh, there's no tricks <laughs> in particular um, that we can advise beyond just taking the time to click through. Uh, checking the dashboard frequently um, as things change and announcements are posted. Um, sometimes I find that my students may have not set up the frequency with which the LMS communicates um, uh, announcements to them. So that's a piece of advice that you could give them uh, to check to make sure that they're either receiving a daily uh, announcement an announcement as it comes through um, when it's first created or a weekly digest of announcements depending on um, the level of uh, their engagement. Um, also I thought uh, was important is for students to list their assignments in a weekly calendar and check them off as they complete them um, and to plan their course readings and take notes before attempting assignments. Uh, another thing another student said that I thought was really important was particularly in the online environment, and especially if they're engaging in um, online discussion boards, uh, it's sort of difficult to read um, intent in our discourse uh, sometimes. So a student suggested that to respond, but don't react. Um, if you have an emotional reaction to what someone said, take a deep breath, reread the post several times, make sure you got all out of it what you needed to get and what they said, and assume that there's no ill intent on the part of the writer first, which I think is good advice for all of us. And one final piece of advice that we're, we'll share that our students had was um, that time management is key. And when classes aren't meeting at set times, it can be very easy for other things in life to become priorities. Um, their work, your life, your family. So, I mean, having a dedicated time to get assignments done um, as if you were attending a face-to-face -face class is, is really key. And there is a couple of other pieces of advice we have over here at the side that they suggested too. You know, if you don't know what something is, look it up. <laughs> uh, that's always great advice. And there's always a YouTube video or um, something uh, that you can pop into Google uh, to ask for more um, detail on engaging a particular aspect of the LMS or even just some content in your courses. Next slide. I think that's it. Okay, just let me unmute over here. Okay, we're back. Hi, everyone. Um, one thing I did forget to mention prior to us starting out is that, <coughs> excuse me, each of the community colleges, we work differently and we have different policies and different, um, different learning management systems. So everything is, is just a little bit different. Uh, I know we use Moodle, Bergen uses Moodle, some use Canvas, others use Blackboard, and now we're bringing our four-year uh, sister institution into the mix over here. So, you know, once again, we do all have different policies and LMS systems, so, you know, we really wanted, I forgot to mention that at the very beginning, but, um, so we do have some questions, and I don't know if Dr. Turner and Dr. Kerrigan, you were able to, to see some of them, um, so the first one I uh, had to do with summer. I'm trying to get to it. Let's see. Uh, summer courses, uh, actually it was a statement. Uh, I think summer courses cannot be compared to the spring or fall courses when discussing teaching online. Summer is intense and many students are already stressed. Do you have any suggestions or comments? I think, I mean, we would agree that the summer is intense um, and uh, I, I think we will also say that um, 
much of this conversation that we've covered on this presentation today is dealing with uh, times of stress and crisis. So um, some of what we're saying, you know, maybe can't be implemented this year because it's already summer, but might be useful uh, for next year as you think about, um, you know, the stress that your, your students are constantly under. Um, mm -hmm. So we understand that though. We are also faculty, um, we teach. Um, so by no means are we trying to be uh, prescriptive in this at all. Um, all of the institutions that you teach at are different. You have different levels of support. Um, you have different classes. Um, but I think the bottom line is we hope that um, the ideas we've provided you today might be of use, uh, certainly during uh, this pandemic, but really uh, of use more broadly. Great, great. Okay, and then I had, uh, we had another message over here. This one came in privately. Uh, what can you tell us about the best practices teaching visual arts studio online? What does the research tell us about what works best in terms of student engagement and delivery of course content? And which resources do you recommend to offer faculty in this discipline, if any? I don't think we can speak to your specific discipline. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're doctoral students in an uh, doctoral faculty in an educational leadership program. Um, I, there are obviously a, um, a lot of great resources uh, online. Um, Educause, uh, which is an or organization that I've worked with a great deal, provides a lot of really wonderful resources for working online. Um, I think what we're here trying to do today is specifically speak to these more broader um, strategies that you can engage uh, when um, there's a crisis. Uh, and a lot of what we're talking about today was very much founded on um, the work that's being done for education in emergencies uh, all around the world. Um, so there are folks who are having these experiences um, every day. Imagine going to work every day and, you know, someone, a uh, military encampment has been set up on campus. Uh, there's a bivouac. Um, these are the types of crises that uh, universities and community colleges and uh, technical schools across the, the world are dealing with every day. So a lot of what we're talking about it is built on, on those types of crises as well. Okay, um, another question. Can you give some examples of quote unquote high touch strategies? And I think you covered a few of them. Sure, Monica. Sure. Um, uh, I think one aspect of high touch is also just um, uh, being proactive and uh, frequency. So um, one of the most important things to remember uh, as you switch online, when you are face to face with your students, you can uh, you see their affect. Mm -hmm. You can tell from body language um, how they're doing. You can see engagement or lack thereof. Um, when students are online, you cannot see those things. And um, without a, a deliberate, um, uh, proactive uh, outreach to students, you may never know uh, the answer to any of those questions. And so part of the high touch is about um, the active, deliberate uh, outreach to students. Um, and anything else? Yeah, I think um, I saw someone in the, the group chat mentioned that uh, their students were actually feeling sort of overwhelmed by the, the um, degree with which they were receiving communications from the institution. And I think that as the instructor, um, part of when we're talking about analyzing the context is sort of getting a feel for what is needed, right? Because we understand that um, each class is different. Uh, I teach, I've been teaching qualitative research methods for the past 11 years, uh, every spring, two sections of it. And no section is exactly the same. However, I have discovered that some of the problems that are consistent uh, that these students have. Um, so what I discovered this year was while they're still experiencing some of the same problems that they always have with some of the course content, that they there was um, um, an elevation of their anxiety around these problems. So I discovered, for example, that I needed to do more weekly um, office hours. 
years. Uh, and or that I needed to do more quick turnaround with feedback on assignments to, in order to lessen their anxiety. So it may be, while we do uh, suggest that for communication, there needs to be a high level of communication with your students during these times, uh, there are also other strategies that you can engage that are higher touch um, that shows that you are fully engaged in the course, fully engaged in their learning, and fully engaged in alleviating their anxiety as much as possible. Yeah. Okay, um, there's another question. Uh, what about addressing the needs of those with accommodations? Sometimes their needs are amplified during these high stressor times. Mm -hmm. So I think this speaks to uh, a lot of what we were talking about earlier with um, understanding uh, that uh, there is, uh, there needs to be a sort of systems approach to um, the, the work that you're doing uh, in a crisis context. Um, and that specifically, um, and there's, uh, that you need to be engaging with these other organizations on campus. So for example, I mentioned the food pantry. This was a big deal at Rowan, um, being able to offer uh, and being able to connect with the resources that the institution offered for our students who were hungry um, and didn't have access to uh, to the things that they needed. Um, and so I think specifically for our students who have accommodations, you know, we uh, is increasing the context uh, with that we have with that the Student Success Center, um, making sure that we understand what those students needs are and that we're using the resources. We don't have to be everything to everyone, <laughs> right? <laughs> that we are using the resources that those individuals who are experts uh, in working with those students um, that we're engaged with them and that uh, and we're pointing students to the resources they need sometimes students don't ask you know the questions uh, and um, and if we're aware that that crisis impacts uh, certain groups differently right um, uh, or, uh, or more disproportionately then if we're aware of that then we can seek those resources and point students towards them before these things become a problem in their ability to be successful. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and one just quick tip on that too. Know, know what your college offers. I mean, that to me is the most important. Um, know a little bit about each area. Know that your college offers a food pantry, a wellness center, who your disability coordinator is. And, and so on and so forth. This way you can actually refer students quickly as needed. Um, so, th so that's extremely important. And, and I know we have a very comprehensive website with all, a lot of that information on there, as I'm sure everybody else in this room does as well. Um, there was something else here about Zoom. Uh, are all LMS Zoom compatible? Uh, Zoom is a platform um, and it, it should be LMS compatible. I think, are, are you talking possibly about the integration into the LMS? If, if I'm reading into that a little correctly, uh, that has to, to, to deal with on the back end. And once again, it depends on um, which system your college is using. We're, we use Zoom, others use Collaborate, which is already uh, within the Blackboard uh, learning management system. So, so really, once again, it depends on what your institution is using and how it's being implemented. So uh, that you would have to check in with your, um, with your LMS administrator or your, your online uh, person that's in charge. Okay, so the integration, yeah. Um, the integration, once again, you would have to uh, find out from the LMS administrator. I know with us, it is compatible with Moodle. Uh, I personally have requested it. it. I don't know if you're from Essex or not, but you know that has to be a request that comes in from or or from someone um, you know in the position to to request that integration into the LMS system. So uh, really speak with your distance learning administrator, and then they can take it from there. Okay. Uh, Lee, if I could just jump on something someone said here about, um, it's uh, Crystal Shook said that students are overwhelmed with information from news media. 
and that we should acknowledge the crisis, but we should, can also become a welcome distraction. And I think that really connects with something that we talked about earlier about this notion that we actually provide stability and routine um, in a way that, uh, um, that can be comforting and help to build students' resilience. So yes, acknowledge, um, but also think about the structures and the expectations and how the activities in your course can provide a, a needed stability to students during, during crisis. Absolutely. Okay, Jake, do you have anything? Oh, if I, if I can just speak to uh, Zoom integration and I can, I can only speak as an example of one adjunct who teaches at one of our state schools um, in central Jersey uh, and how it's set up there. And it's different at the community colleges, it's different at, at every institution. But we have uh, Canvas as our course shell. Um, uh, most of us at this institution went to emergency remote instruction, much, much like many of you uh, on the line today. Uh, so we did not have the opportunity uh, to, to take the advice uh, that we're hearing today about uh, going to the shell, prepping ahead of time, developing your syllabus for an, in an online environment, pre-recording your lectures, that type of thing, and, and figuring out how you're going to have students interact throughout the semester. We, we didn't have that, that, that luxury. Um, uh, we, we went to, okay, our class meets 530 every Wednesday, so we're going to log everybody in on, on Zoom. We had numerous platforms available to us, and, and it was left to each instructor, which, comfort le which one do you have the most comfort level with? Uh, Zoom was not integrated with our LMS. It was a separate login uh, through our institution and we delivered our instruction. Now we could record the webinars we, or we could record the, the, the uh, meetings like we're recording this and we could then take those MP4 files and place them into the course shell for students to access later. It was a, it was a separate workaround so to speak. So it goes back to what Lee said earlier and that is um, you need to reach out to your inst instructional designers at your instructional designers, librarians, whoever it may be at your institution, uh, who, who's responsible for developing the course shells and things of that nature, and really work with that person one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, that's what they're there for. That's, that, uh, those folks are, are who primarily makes up this distance education affinity group uh, championed, uh, uh, chartered by the community college presidents. Mm -hmm. Those folks are the ones you want to reach out to. Um, uh, other than that, um, I'm trying to think if I have any other things to add of uh, uh, substance. Uh, I want to address your question, Jake. So um, I, I'm, I'm looking at some of the replies on here. You've noticed that in conferences, students are no longer able to see each other. Um, well, once again, when we set up these Zoom calls and conferences, um, you know, we have the ability to make sure that everybody's video is off if it's a webinar then it, it's a totally different practice where everybody is muted and there's no questions asked. So really, it depends on who is setting up that meeting. When I set up this meeting, I put everybody into um, a waiting room, you know, uh, and, and at, put everybody on mute as well. So, um, you know, once again, whoever is running the classroom, whoever is running a, a, a webinar or a conference, those are the decisions, you know, of, of the presenter. So. Um, yeah, and, and I'm looking at some of these right now. Video is distracting. Yeah. There are, and there are pros and cons to each one. In, in, my, in my class, I was sharing with, with, with the folks early before we started. In my class, my students logged on and I said, I don't care if you put your camera on or not. And it turns out my students, the majority of them, they would turn their cameras off, put their uh, uh, microphones on mute. I would call on them you know, individually to participate in our conversation and, and I got nothing. So they would, turn their, their, they would turn their cameras off, turn their microphones off and just leave and, and pretend they were in class. So, okay. So then I required the students for the remainder of the semester to turn their cameras on. So I knew they were there. So there are, there are pros and cons to each and it's just a matter of your comfort level um, in delivering uh, and, the instruction. Yeah, and it's also, you know, what, what is your institutional policy? If there is a policy, you know, um, what a student may not want their, um, you know, their background seen, you know, I, I have students in my class that once I tell them, okay, guys, we're going, we're going to start recording right now, they immediately turn off their video. 
So, you know, it, it really, it depends. Now, if there's a test or something, then it's a different story. But, um, and this is a, and this is a completely different conversation if we're flipping the model, right? right. If we're designing the course to be an online course, exactly. where as an instructor, you have the lead time to pre-record your lectures so that students watch the lectures when they are able to watch them. And then you're meeting with students, whether it's individually or in small groups, you know, it's a different dynamic when you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 students on a, on a zoom like this, as opposed to 30, 40, 50, your whole class on a Zoom like this. So it's a completely different dynamic based on how the course is designed to be rolled out during the semester. Yeah, and, and one thing, um, I, I th and I did want to stress this, and I know, as I said before, I see a lot of repeat, you know, um, uh, participants, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, we, we made the switch early spring, as, as uh, Dr. Kerrigan and Dr. Turner said, you know, because of emergency remote teaching, you know, we all had to make that switch pretty quick. So now that we're all online, it, it's a whole different ball game where I think some of us or a lot of us have now incorporated that synchronous component in. So, you know, and are we moving towards online in the fall? You know, until we hear something otherwise, right, Jake, then, then right now I'd say that we're still online. I mean, you may be able to speak a little bit more about that. Right. Well, of course, I'm not a spokesperson for the governor, but I do know that um, a number of our community college presidents are working with a number of public four year university presidents on a task force that was appointed by Governor Murphy uh, to develop a series of recommendations and guidelines and guidance of how colleges and universities can safely reopen in the fall sometime in the fall. And there are a number of considerations at play. But what I will share with you is the safest, the safest approach across the board universally is going to be um, as many courses that can be delivered online as possible will be delivered online. Um, there may be 10 to 20% of the students, student population on campus at one time. And there are going to be several considerations given as to which students are allowed back on campus. So for example, students that are in culinary or automotive or um, science courses, healthcare, allied health, they have to do in-person clinicals and assessments and labs. They will get, they might, they might get the opportunity to be on campus for some part of the time, but the rest of the instruction will be remote. Plus also consider those students who have had significant challenges in whether it's broadband access access to a laptop, computer access, things of that nature. Um, those students who are significantly disadvantaged in being able to pivot to the room, emergency remote environment. Those students may be invited to come back to campus sooner rather than later because they just don't have the technology and the wherewithal uh, to learn remotely. So there are a number of considerations in play as soon as we know what the guidance is, of course, we will be distributing that to all the community college presidents and the academic affairs vice presidents and student services and so on. Um, but but it, there is a lot of uncertainty. And if there is an uptick in COVID cases, we have to be in a position where, hey, we're going to phase two soon. Well, we're gonna move back to phase one. We need to be able to pivot uh, between and amongst these different phases and I think that's one of the benefits of having this webinar today um, uh, to learn from two faculty members who have done this uh, throughout their careers at Rowan, done it very well and very successfully. And, and we very much appreciate your guidance and, and your suggestions and recommendations that you've shared with all of us today. Thank you so much for having us. This has been great. I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk about uh, both the practice that we engage and also the research that we have that we do in other contexts and how people other uh, institutions and students and faculty around the world deal with these sorts of things. And we're thrilled to be um, able to be a sister partner uh, to the community colleges and to um, the faculty who teach at community colleges. So uh, it was great to be here today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Uh, uh, selfishly, I'm going to thank again, uh, Drs. Turner and Kerrigan. Uh, the work that they do has impacted 
hundreds of lives in the community college sector in New Jersey and have helped so many people uh, obtain that critical credential of doctorate in education to be able to advance their careers, me being one of them. So of course I'm a little biased, but thank you for all that you have done for those of us who have, who have enrolled in the program, what you've done for me and my family personally, and thank you for what you've done for all of us here today by sharing your expertise. And thank all of you for being on the line today. This webinar will be available asynchronously on the Student Success Center website, njstudentsuccess.org in a couple days. We also have a number of um, uh, national resources that are available on that website as well. Uh, everything from Achieving the Dream to Education Advisory Board uh, to some resources that our Distance Education Affinity Group has put together as well to help all of you as you continue uh, to strengthen your ability to deliver uh, online education going forward as we deal with this pandemic. So thank you, everybody. We're going to call the webinar, and uh, we'll see you again real soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye.